describe the impact on you? It made me wonder if I want to do this job anymore. Well, today's staff members from Freeman High School shared what they witnessed the day one student was killed and three others were injured in a school shooting. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Hanrahan. Good to have you with us. I'm Jane McCarthy. Their testimony is part of a week long hearing to determine if the accused school shooter will be tried as an adult. He was 15 years old at the time of the shooting and will soon be 18. Krem 2's Amanda Broly has more from court today. Today we heard testimony from the Freeman School District psychologist, the high school principal at the time, as well as the school resource officer. And their testimony today will appeal to that criteria that will help determine whether or not the accused shooter will be tried as an adult. Now, Jody Sweeney is the district psychologist who worked with the accused shooter in previous years. She says there are Freeman students and staff that have left the district since the shooting. She describes the effects of that day as catastrophic. Since the shooting, she's noticed Freeman students and staff have been in survival mode and now showing physical and mental exhaustion. This year is the year that I'm seeing some massive executive functioning issues in everybody, students, staff, community members, parents. Um, there's a lot of physical and mental exhaustion. There's a lot of irritability. There's a lot of memory issues, planning issues. Later in the day, Detective Scott Bonney took the stand and he interviewed the accused shooter right after he was arrested. He read the transcript of that interview and we do want to warn you that this may be difficult to hear. Or like people, I, I'd say something funny, they wouldn't laugh. Or like, I don't really care about that, but it's just like, I know I did something for once and I'm not a failure at it. What made you choose that area of the school to go to? replied it was filled with the most people now in his testimony the detective also said that the shooter admitted to him that he had been planning this for about two years now the hearing will continue to, on monday morning reporting from the spokane county courthouse amanda roley creme 2 news the spokane police department is asking for your help identifying the people in this vehicle it is difficult to see but they may be linked to the shooting of two Eastern Washington University football players in downtown Spokane on Saturday. The photos are from a surveillance camera at West Main Avenue and North Division Street at around 1.20 a.m. on July 13th. Anyone with information is asked to call Crime Check at that number right there at the bottom of your screen. Both of the Eastern Washington students are expected to make a full recovery. The Spokane County Medical Examiner identified a woman killed in a home in northwest Spokane. She was 20 year old Alyssa Dodd. She died from blunt head injuries on Wednesday. The medical examiner ruled her death a homicide. Well, 19 year old Bryce Thompson, this man now a murder suspect. He's held in the Missoula County Jail on a $1 million bond. The Spokane Center for Justice has filed a lawsuit against the city of Spokane on behalf of a resident of a place dubbed Camp Hope. In December of last year, Spokane police removed dozens of tents from the makeshift camp that sprung up outside of City Hall. Krem 2's Casey Decker joins us live in studio now with a closer look at that lawsuit. Casey? Yeah, guys, this suit actually comes less than a week after a similar suit was filed by a family who had been living in Camp Hope. Now, that first suit is against only the city of Spokane. This new one sues the city, plus the police department and a number of individuals, including the mayor. Though the first one is on behalf of a family and the new one today is just for one man, both make essentially the same arguments as to how the city violated their rights. When the city decided to clear out Camp Hope, the part encampment, part protest outside City Hall, they posted these notices on the tents. Move your stuff within 48 hours. These are the crux of the lawsuits. The notices cite the city's anti-camping ordinance, promise the option of hearings, and say items of obvious value will be preserved. The first argument in both suits is that the camping ordinance was not enforceable, that it can only be enforced when there's shelter space available. The suits make two claims here. One, that the warming centers don't count as shelter space because they close every morning and leave no place for people to store their stuff. Two, that there weren't even enough spaces in the warming centers at the time of the notices. Now, the second argument. The suits call those hearings the notice promised a sham. They say it was just one cop presiding, that there was no due process, some people didn't even get hearings, and that the cop rejected every single plea. 
The third argument, that the city did not preserve items of obvious value. The suits say workers simply threw everything into garbage trucks. And not only that, that there was not even a plan to preserve valuable items because there was no space set aside to store them. Now the lawyers in both cases say all of that adds up to the city depriving Camp Hope residents of legal and human rights. They're looking for money for their clients and for the courts to stop the city from doing similar evictions in the future. Now we reached out to the city today for comment and a spokeswoman said that they had none. Mark, Jane. All right, Casey, thank you very much. In other news, a fire in Benton County has grown to 42,000 acres. The Cold Creek fire is burning northwest of Richland. Firefighters say it is 60% contained. No homes or buildings are damaged at this time and no injuries have been reported. Thankfully, this weekend we won't see winds as high as they mm -hmm. were yesterday and our temperatures, though, are rising. Yeah, meteorologist Thomas Patrick in the Weather Center for Tom tonight. And Thomas, that heat wave should get us closer to average. Yeah, and then some, Mark and Jane, because it has been quite cool for July standards all week long. But the outlook next week, it basically flip flops what's going on across the nation. So instead, the western U.S. is going to be much above average, while the eastern U.S. is cooler than average. And uh, in case you didn't know, well, there's a whole bunch of excessive heat warnings through the Midwest and the uh, Atlantic coast. So they're dealing with heat indices, heat and humidity combined well above 100 degrees. Meanwhile, in Spokane, doesn't that seem pleasant for July weather? 73 degrees, very low humidity, and the wind's not too strong either. In fact, our temperatures today have been in the 70s across the board, with a few locations still in the 60s as of this hour, including Moscow, St. Mary's, and Sandpoint. So cool for July weather, and we got another cool night ahead of us. So if you are heading downtown for this evening, temperatures will easily be in the 50s and down to around 50 degrees by tomorrow morning, but it warms up quickly from there. We'll highlight how quick that change takes place, how many days we'll see in the 90s next week. That in just a few minutes. About 20 minutes from Feltz Field, um, I, just silence. Uh, my engine stopped completely. Well, that is one level-headed pilot who had to land his plane right there on the highway. It happened late last night on Highway 97 near South Caribou Ridge Road in Kootenai County. Krem 2's Tim Pham has more from the pilot who pulled it off. Really a remarkable outcome for this pilot. He was able to safely land this plane without any injuries or causing any damage. You can't beat the views from above in Montana. That beauty was interrupted by a silence Scott Morledge Hampton won't soon forget. No smoke, no fire, uh, nothing scary about that beyond just the scariness of having an engine failure. But he knew something wasn't right and radioed this message to a tower in Spokane. Then that I would like to declare an emergency and that I was looking for a place to land. With little time to act, he relied on his knowledge as a pilot. I enriched the mixture and pushed in the propeller control and, and gave it some more throttle, but uh, it, it just wasn't having it. Uh, that engine was not going to restart. When nothing else seemed to work, he used his GPS to look for private airports, but couldn't find one nearby. He eventually found a field and Highway 97. Hey, but after that car went by, it was uh, there was no one on the road, so I continued to bank to the right and uh, and I placed it on the road. And Incredibly, he dodged power lines and landed at the top of Beauty Bay Hill. Very scary, uh, very lucky. It took more than luck to successfully land this plane on the highway. He's able to smile about it now. His wife, though, might have a different response. When I go home and tell this story, my wife will probably never, ever fly with me again. That's no, just glad, just glad to be here, <laughs> glad to be alive. So this actually isn't the first time Morledge Hampton crash landed. In 1998, he safely landed the same type of plane with his father in Skagway, Alaska. In the studio, I'm Tim Pham, Krem 2 News. Great outcome, and get a little of this. A viewer sent us this video earlier today, and there's the plane. <laughs> it's that plane taking off. Not on the runway, that's the highway. And I don't think that trooper there probably gave him a ticket for speeding. <laughs> no. no? I'm just glad he got safely off the ground.